Where is Aon? Yep. Thanks, Lance. Okay. Yep. That's cool. What paper are we on? We're on paper 16, page 71. So um, we'll hand off to you, David. Yes. Um, firstly, I'd like to welcome um, Matthew, introduce Matthew Wilson from Aon Insurance, Aon uh, Waikato Lass um, chosen insurance advisors and um, have been working with Lass for a number of years. Um, in terms of insurance, council benefits from a um, collective agreement around insurance in terms of the the, the price premium, the, va the value we get from our insurance offering. So we, we work with all other councils, although we have our own requirements that feed into that. Um, the reason for the paper today is um, twofold. One is we have an increase in insurance premiums that is significant, and the uh, insurance year, which starts on the 1st of November um, this year, um, requires council approval in terms of the cost of that insurance. It's above TE's delegation. The second reason is that the Audit and Risk Committee who have heard this paper um, had some quite high energy in, for us to bring the paper to council so council laws had an opportunity to understand the significant shifts associated with the insurance market in New Zealand which is driving the, the increase in insurance premium. So I'll take the paper as read but I'll um, ask uh, Matthew to uh, give Council Laws a, a quick overview of what's driving the increases in insurance premiums across the country and um, then leave it open for questions. You're on. Am I on? Excellent. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I apologise firsthand if I don't follow protocols 100% and answer a question directly um, and not through the chair, so if you can just bear with me on that. Um, yeah, this year's renewal has been um, an interesting process um, and, and David has asked for there to be some sort of background as to the global insurance market because that does affect New Zealand and I'll, I'll just go through some of this with you to sort of give you a, a, an idea of the playing field that we're in at the moment. Um, the main driver for global premium increases um, in the last 18 months, 12 to 18 months, has been natural disasters. And when we say natural disasters in New Zealand, everybody instantly thinks of earthquakes. Um, that isn't actually the case globally, whilst there have been some significant earthquakes. The majority of natural disasters for the 2017-18 year um, were wildfires, storms, floods, hurricanes, those sort of items. And not only have they increased in um, severity in some cases, they have also increased in frequency to the point where in 2017, the um, cost to the insurance market for those events was a 163% higher than the 2000, and 2000 to 2016 average. It's been significant. Um, and whether we want to believe it or not, and I don't want to get into an environmental climate change conversation today because I'm the least qualified person to do that, <laughs> um, something is happening. We are seeing these things being experienced with greater frequency um, and in some cases significant cost increases. Um, I have a family friend who nearly lost their house in Portugal um, about a year ago when there was the Portuguese wildfires. We've just seen the events in America recently. In one day we had fires in Queensland and a severe rainstorm in Sydney um, about a week ago. Something is going on, something is happening. Um, it is having a global impact on the insurance markets. How does that feed down to New Zealand? Pretty much every major insurer that transacts business in New Zealand is owned offshore. 
The impact of that is that there are increased reinsurance costs um, that these insurers are facing, so therefore it's a pretty much a basic supply and demand type issue in that there is a finite amount of capital globally which goes into insurance products. And if you want to buy into that capital, there is a cost associated with doing that. The other component to this, and I'm not a, an economist, is also the fact that global interest rates have been changing. We've come out of a period of where they have been very low. A number of finance, uh, financial institutions were looking for alternative investment vehicles for their monies, and they went into the insurance market. Now they're starting to get better returns um, in other areas and have had to start writing checks out for insurance claims. Um, that has contributed to the reduction in global capital available. Um, this isn't a Hamilton City issue. This is a New Zealand issue. In fact, it is a global issue. Everybody and you as individuals will be seeing pricing increases in your own domestic insurances, your motor vehicles, those sort of purchases. Um, that's sort of some of the background to that. If we, um, as just as an aside, there was a report that came out recently, and I haven't seen the report completely, but it has now rated, this was an insurer produced report, it rates New Zealand as the second highest risk country from natural disaster losses in the world. Um, I do not know at this stage whether that is on a per capita basis or the method of calculation, but this is painting a picture of how New Zealand is being viewed, especially when the number one rated uh, country in the world is Bangladesh. Um, and that's not a slight Bangladesh, but my geography is relatively limited, but Bangladesh basically exists because a river has been flooding for millions and millions of years and it's on a floodplain. It's just the silt up. That's the reason Bangladesh is there, so it's an incredibly unstable country from a geological point of view. Um, there have been various reports produced by GNS and the like. Um, I think one of them says that New Zealand currently has $50 billion worth of assets at exposure from sea level rise. Um, yeah, um, now, OK, we might be saying, well, why do I want to know about that in Hamilton? Um, it increases the water table as well. So if we have a sea level rise, it increases the water table, you get more prone to flooding because there's less runoff capability within the ground. So there are a number of things happening. Could you explain what GNS is? Um, I mean, who, what is it? It's a government agency, as far as my understanding goes, that looks into all of this from a national basis as to what are our exposures. So, um, yeah, thank you, David. Um, so the bottom line is, that's quite a gloomy picture, but the bottom line is costs are increasing, there is limited capital available globally through market changes, so your basic cost of insurance is increasing. That's for everybody. If we bring that back to New Zealand a little bit, um, I've got a house in Coromandel. Two years ago, I think it was, we were meant to be up there for Christmas and New Year. We came home early because the weather forecast was going to suggest there was going to be a downpour and half the Thames Coast Road or sections of the Thames Coast Road disappeared, so we wouldn't have been able to get home. As I say, these things are happening. The cyclones in 2018 that came through and caused damage in the severe weather events in New Zealand, roughly $1.2 billion worth of damage. Domestic, I think there was an article in the Herald today, um, domestic costs from natural disasters, about $240 million, which is why I say you're all likely to see changes to your domestic home and contents premiums. Um, to narrow that, right, that focus down, if you have been a business in Wellington, where there is a huge natural disaster exposure and accumulation of assets, you would be looking at anywhere between 100 to 300 percent increases in your natural disaster premiums. So that's the earthquake component. Um, the insurers don't apply all of those carte blanche. They look at the country and do assess earthquake exposures. The Waikato, I got told off for saying this, I said the Waikato was benign. The Waikato is relatively benign. There is still an earthquake exposure in the Waikato, um, but it's a lot less than other parts of the, the country. And that is reflected in the rates. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is the current market in New Zealand is the extent of earthquake cover that we are capable to buy. It's some of the widest in the world. Um, I have uh, mentioned to people before uh, as a slide that we have which shows some bar charts, vertical graphs. Um, which compare insured cost of an event to the total cost of the event. The Canterbury earthquake sequence, very tragic event, doesn't want to be repeated. About 70% of the costs associated that were insured. 
You look at the Fukushima event in Japan, which followed not long after, because Japan has not been able to buy to the extent that we can in New Zealand earthquake insurance, only about 20% of those costs were insured. So we are got to factor in that potentially we're going to have to see a change in the way and the extent of cover provided by insurers in the earthquake market. Um, I think this report refers to the premium increases being in the region of sort of 30%. Um, that's, that's, that's two factors involved in that. You've had an increase in your declared values for your material damage assets and your infrastructural assets, and there has been an underlying premium increase. Um, if we have another major earthquake in New Zealand, I'm not sure what we're going to be able to do in terms of the extent of cover that you will be able to purchase. There will still be something there, but the pricing and the extent of cover, that's an unknown at this stage. So what that means is, um, how do we deal with this? We're in a market that is changing. How do we deal with it? The previous six, seven years, the market has basically been a soft market. Insurance premiums have been declining. You have been able to get year-on-year -year savings on the, the rates um, without having to look at anything like changing deductible levels or extent of cover or loss limits, that sort of stuff. There's been no need to do it because it would have been imprudent to do it because you've been in a falling market. We're now at a point where the market is starting to change. Um, I honestly cannot tell you what that market's going to be doing in three years' time. But what we do need to do now is start looking and becoming a more discerning purchaser. Um, and I've already spoken with, um, with the guys about, uh, okay, what's the insurance strategy? What are we going to do moving forward? Um, how do we mitigate some of these premium increases? Where do we attach insurance programs? What deductible levels do we want to look at? So these are conversations we are having and are going to have so that um, next year when everything comes through, there is a a sort of a strategy defined around that. Okay. Um, that, I think, yep. paints the picture. Yep. yep. Just open the questions. Okay, so before we start on questions, I just want to remind um, members what Matthew has said. He said he's not an economist. He said he's not an environmentalist, an environmental scientist. He doesn't know why it's raining. He doesn't know why the houses are burning, why things are burning down, and he doesn't know why there's so many earthquakes. So there's no point going in those directions. This is about the fact that insurance has gone up 30%, and that's why the paper's here. I also want to um, point out that there's three members here who are in the Audit and Risk Committee, and we talked about this for at least an hour. And um, I don't want to relitigate all those questions, so I'm looking for fresh questions from new people, unless it's something new outside of the Audit and Risk Committee. So we'll start with Mark. Fresh. Um, um, how long have you been doing what you're doing? In New Zealand, I've been doing it for 13 and a half years. Yes. So have you ever seen um, conditions in the world change that make insurance costs go down as dramatically as go up? We've had a component of that over the last... Um, that's the point about the year 2000 to 2016. Right. Um, the 2017 numbers are 163, I think the number is, percent higher. Yep. So there's been this rapid increase in losses. You had a surplus of um, capital available over those periods for various financial reasons. Yep. So going back to that supply, supply and demand type issue, there was lots of capital. People wanted to sell that capital, therefore there was a reduction in the price of that capital. Okay. We've now seen a constriction, reduction of that capital, and an increase in the claims volumes. Okay. No, that's me. Thank okay. you. Councillor Rob. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just, just picking up on your comments, Matthew, um, is it fair to say that if these natural disasters or these natural d events are reduced, then premiums generally will come down going forward? I think that the pressure, the pressure on the markets would change. Um, the comments that we get at the moment is, well, we've paid X hundred million dollars worth of claims, that's why we need to be charging more premium. If that tails off, then there is a, it's a different conversation to have with the yep. markets. Okay. Uh, so the market's sufficiently competitive enough yes. to sort of say, you can go to another reinsurer who might come in and... and, and Correct. Okay. The second question, uh, and I'm, I apologise if this is not a new question, but, you, but the staff state in paragraph 14, Hamilton City is still considered to be 
one of the lowest impacted. Did I get from your presentation that um, we get a benefit in terms of our premiums compared with other insurers in the LAS group because we're, we're less impacted by the, by the possibility of a natural disaster? The LAS group um, consists of councils from Thames, Coromandel, all the way down to South Waikato. Mm -hmm. It doesn't include Taupo. Um, across that range, there are differing natural disaster exposures. Um, Thames, Coromandel, tsunami, flood. That's their biggest exposure. Mm -hmm. um, you get, as a council, Hampton City Council get benefits for being in that program because it's, it's economies of scale. We go into the insurance market with, off the top of my head, the total declared values for your assets as collectively is about $2 billion, of which Hamilton, off the top of my head, has about a $1 billion worth of those assets. Um, the entire group receives benefit from that. And okay. yes, there okay. are... So it's, so it's, so it's evenly that. spread over yes. the group. I think yeah. you've answered yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. And the other question is around the uh, specific increases. And I note professional indemnity insurance has gone up 137%. Now, as I understand professional indemnity, it's when we make a mistake, somebody can collectively sue us and the insurance, hopefully the insurer will pay out whatever, or, or a significant part of whatever the um, litigator is successful with. Um, I, th I thought we had great difficulty buying this insurance. And when I think back to leaky homes and a, a few other things that the council has had over its recent life, uh, we found that those particular uh, events were, un were not included or not insured. What, what, what is in our professional indemnity insurance that, that sort of justifies the $138,000 premium? Um, if you can just bear with me a second. The biggest um, exposure we have seen in that space recently is building consenting. Okay, okay, that's fine. Look, I understand, understand the risks here, and I know what some of our other councils, uh, not partner councils, but I know the, yeah, okay, fair enough, that's, that's answered the question. And the last question is perhaps more to David. Um, the three, I'll put my glasses on, 387,000 shortfall in our budget, how are we going to record, that obviously impacts on our financial strategy. That's right. Uh, so how are we going to record that? in terms of uh, um, that cost and its impact on our already uh, tight balancing the books budget. We'll, we'll need to bring through that as an unbudgeted cost through the um, financial strategy monitoring report through the finance committee. Okay, and that'll stay there for the and rest of the year. And that'll stay there. And what we'll also do is ensure that we have the flow on effect for um, the remainder of the 10 year period. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank, thanks, Chair. Thank you. Hi, Matthew, thank Hello. you for that. Um, um, I'm going to, my questions are different from what I asked in Brisbane Audit. They go a little bit further um, and follow on from uh, Rob's questions. Uh, although we may be in a safer position of resilience, less earthquake prone part of the country, some of our um, primary assets, water treatments on, reasonably safe, etc. What you're saying though is, did I hear, do I take from what you're saying? That, that we, as part of New Zealand Inc, part of this global economy as well, will bear the cost of the, both the global and the national situation. So if, if something happens in the global reinsurance market, another catastrophe that at a global scale really, really hurts, and this is happening all the time at the moment, the wildfires, if there's another massive disaster in New Zealand, hopefully not, um, that even all local government, even safer cities like Hamilton, will bear the cost. That's what you said, wasn't it? Yeah, basically, very, very, very fundamentally, the principle of insurance is that the cost of the few is borne by the many. That's right. Um, and that includes we bear the cost of all our coastal com um, communities. It's over 65 63, 65 billion from the latest right. local government report, just went up recently. But there's a hell of a lot of infrastructure. Um, May uh, I add one point to yeah, that, though? Please um, do. However, how that cost is then allocated across the country um, 
because we are in a competitive market and insurers need to mm. sell insurance, then they do take into account the relative seismicity exposure of, of those regions. So you've kind of asked my, answered one of my next Sorry. questions. No, that's fine. That's what I wanted to know. And the follow-on from that is, well, I was going to say, are there mitigations um, that we can put in place or, or work we can do to position ourselves to be more resilient and therefore to be more competitive at purchasing good price insurance? Can we do that? Yes, um, and, and we are scoping some of that works at the moment. Okay, so my question now is to you, David, if that's, that's the case, I have an interest in, in how we go forward in this very fast-growing city. How do we, uh, are we giving sufficient focus, do you think, on building the type of resilience that will stand us in good stead? We've got his, the historic stock, you know, we've got buildings that every time we renew them, we've got to do the earthquake exercise and so on. And they're going to cost us. They're going to continue to cost us. New builds, new subdivisions, new et cetera, et cetera. Are we, is this, um, this issue integrated with that? Because they're both relevant. I mean, you talked, Matthew, about um, permeable surfaces and flood and water. So um, I want to understand at some time, David, how we are building a city that is factoring in resilience against whether you want to believe in climate change or not, resilience against the extreme weather events and disasters we might experience. Sure. So this is a question for building and for the it central is. government and the Building Act. This is not a question for an insurance broker who's, I'm or an insurance manager who's here. I'm but asking David that question. We'll, we'll, well, we'll, uh, follow, we'll follow it away for a later day. Yeah, it's not, it's not a question for today. All right, about, well, I'll, I'll about, save some comments for Because it goes straight back to the Building Act. Okay, I'll save some comments for debate. Thank you. Okay, um, so we're in debate. Uh, Paula, uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Paula. Uh, just Whoops. If I might, the reason I do raise that question is because this is one of the problems uh, facing New Zealand that is probably, well, it's, it's the most expensive challenge that New Zealand Inc. has in front of it, adapting to what they need to do with their infrastructure and how they build their communities going forward. Um, I sit on the local um, government advisory uh, policy group in Wellington, and this fo is a key focus. It's one of our three core topics for this reason. And I don't yet get the feeling, not, uh, no disrespect to my colleagues, I don't get the feeling that enough of us are engaging in the detail and understanding of this, or that somehow we're in the same sort of um, broad denial about what this is going to mean. We're on it. We're in it now. We're in the situation of having to deal with this. This is not something into the future when uh, sea level rises. This is now, and you know because you live in the Coromandel, Matthew, but this is now and Hamilton will experience it and we need in, in this term of council to get all of us understanding what this means for us in Hamilton City. Thank you. All those four, any against? Carried unanimously. Okay, we're now moving um, back to <laughs> Item 9, and Angela, uh, Councillor Angela, questions for you to Lance. Uh, thank you, Lance. Um, Lance, we've taken questions from Angela straight to you. That's where, where we were. Uh, thank you, Angela. We're back on the river plan, yeah, aren't that's we? It, yeah. Item 9, Angela. Page 30, Angela. Um, hang on, I'm just checking. I can go to someone else first, Andrew. Yeah, no, go yeah, to someone Councillor else, yeah. Mark. Thank you. Um, Lance, I'd just like to continue um, that line I was talking about with Natasha earlier on. Regards the thing I'm always banging on about, about preemptive river, river uh, maintenance and stabilisation, is there a possibility for a river plan to bring that in, rather than us being relying always on, um, is it risks and opportunities we take the slip money out of in the future? Is this something that you'd consider as a part of the, the river plan? Uh, I'd see it as a bit different to the river plan. I'd see it, uh, my understanding, it's not an inherent part of um, the priorities in the river plan. I think um, I think you're talking more around integration with um, Chris's area around what's happening with catchments um, and the tributaries that go to the river. Then obviously dealing with the Waikato um, Regional Council. I think if there was ever any review of the river plan, that's something that might be brought up and discussed by elected members. So, I thought this actually kind of was the review of the river plan. It, no, this is, this, is, um, this, is a task force. this is just a task force about implementation of projects um, heading up towards um, the next triennium. 
Okay. Thanks. Councillor Rob. Yeah, thank you. A um, couple of questions, Lance. One, one is around um, 3C of the re staff recommendation about the, the task force. Is, is it in your, in your mind at the moment that you would take the terms of reference from the last task force and bring that forward as a starting point to um, either make changes or redevelop what might come out in terms of moving forward with a new, new set of reference, uh, terms of reference, or uh, do Correct. you think the existing one was pretty good and yeah. it just needs a bit of tweaking? Uh, yeah, I think exactly what you've said. Um, look at the existing ones and give it a bit of a tweak. Yep. Just and I think we just tried to highlight in the report that there's circumstances changing. Yeah, yeah. And yep. and obviously, I think when we wrote the river plan. You know, we didn't know where a regional theatre was going to be and all those sorts of things. So yep. it's just one yep. example. So would we pull the dust off, uh, off the coffee table um, 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 report from the last task force and use that also as a starting point, that we would look at the projects that were identified then and look at the relevance of those now in terms of how whether we might push those ones forward or whether we might hold on some of those to perhaps consider other river plan developments that weren't in there that perhaps might have some preference or priority of this current council? Um, Ye yes and no. Uh, I think we, <coughs> if you look at the report with the journey we've been on with briefings and report backs to council over the last wee while, I think we'd still try and concentrate on the, the priority projects that were set during previous annual plans. Yep. And then I think um, Councillor O'Leary brought up one before around, I think it was the um, uh, the, the beach. Wellington Beach um, yep, yep. study about. Um, so, so I think we probably stick to the priorities and also probably where the opportunities are now. Like I said, circumstances changing. If we get the provincial growth funding, we've put an application which we've briefly outlined in here. Yep. I think it's really to focus on those sorts of things about, you know, and, and that will focus the mind because we'll actually have to sign a contract and deliver on those things. So. Um, so I don't see as the task force role to actually start um, redebating the whole river plan and the whole action plan, um, mm -hmm. but it will be probably the front end of that. Yep. Okay. And last question is around um, the personnel, and I <clears throat> I recall, <coughs> excuse me, that um, Deputy Mayor um, Martin had uh, an idea as to who some of the personnel might be on that task force. Did we in the last task force, and look, I can't quite remember, did we have external members? On the task force, or was it staff and and elected members? Staff and elected members. And My understanding is that um, uh, there are other elected members who used to attend the meetings who yep. weren't actually appointed to the task force who were interested, and in, and so it was um, formal but informal. But we didn't have a whole bunch of external people on it or anything like that. Do you think, given, and I was there at the at the launch of the last one, you know, the function that we had down at the Meteor, and given that there was huge um, um, uh, community buy-in to the idea, and <clears throat> not necessarily to each of the projects, but certainly to the buy-in of the river plan, do you think there might be some value for us? And I'm just floating this because I'm not sure where, it, where whether it's intended in here, but whether there would be some value for this count for council to actually look at some external members, and I, I don't want to really re-litigate what we discussed on Tuesday in, in terms of that process. But do you think there's some value in, in bringing in some some community people who might have some levels of expertise or, or interest in that area? I think there's always value in that, but um, I would just caution that this is really a task force from elected members to give direction to staff on um, essentially what to do over the, the remainder of this annual plan and then what we do in next annual plan. Obviously, you know, the end of the triennium is coming up next year. My advice would be to keep this reasonably internal at the moment mm -hmm. and then I think and then let the new administration have that discussion and make that decision. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And Councillor Angela, do, do you, you were you were first? Do you want to jump in or? Yeah, thank you. I just a couple of questions just on that actually, and I don't know that this is the 
the Flance is the right person to be asking this, but I did want to understand what the process for establishing the members on this group was going to be. Maybe that's a question for the governance manager. I don't know. I want to understand what the process for appointing, there's already been one member appointed onto this group, um, so I wanted to understand what process was going to be followed to appoint other members. Or maybe it is for the GM. Essentially, the recommendation is, and remember it's only a staff recommendation, yeah. um, yeah, we're suggesting that um, elected members put names forward, mm -hmm. and um, but we've suggested uh, around the um, uh, iwi considerations is that we have Mongai Te Porter on there, because um, she's the Waikato Tainui rep on the cs &E committee. Yeah. Um, that's why we've suggested that. Um, so. Um, mm. I sort of feel like I've been backed into a corner on this question after the debate no, 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 the PGG that's the other why day. I, no, that's, I'm absolutely not doing that. That was all politics last Tuesday. I'll leave my comments for debate. Councillor Paula. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mayor Andrew. I already asked the question about the um, path between Victoria and the river, and so I just want to follow on from that because we ran out of time. And, and so my understanding is um, the construction of a path between Victoria and the river and the new... Um, museum is now considered to be fairly urgent for the new museum to get underway, right? So, in terms of the next step, does this? And talking with the residents, we've acknowledged that we've received some um, correspondence from them. And the next step, what is that next step? And when will we be asked to look for the funding? And when will we be talking about the what that pathway looks like, where it's situated? Because we've seen. We've seen the original ideas, especially as I was on that river task force before, and we've also seen those visionary ideas of the central city park with the terrace shops and all sorts. So there's more than one idea in the ether is what I'm trying to say, Lance. We've seen a whole lot of vision, and um, you know, it would be quite understandable if the residents and business owners around that area also didn't understand. So where does that get nutted out? Uh, I think the first thing is we need, um, we need some money. And I think you're right to point that out. As Natasha reported back um, last time, that um, uh, you know we don't have the funding uh, with the current approved uh, monies. But um, notwithstanding that, we're waiting to hear from the provincial growth fund. And if we get that, then we will have the funds for that. So we're hoping to hear some indication of that prior to Christmas, or more formally, probably in Janu late January. Okay. I would say the task force could uh, once. Once the task or once council is aware of whether or not we've got the provincial growth funding, which means we'd have some money, then the task force could actually then go ahead. That would be a high priority, and we can work on that, and obviously do the necessary consultation, and then um, bring bring back everything to council for a formal endorsement, and away we go. So, just to clarify, you're, you're waiting for some some indication of good luck with with the funding, and then when we've got the funding, we'll go and do another step. Of consultation with affected parties, etc., and get into some design? Is that what you're saying? Well, we've been doing that. This thing isn't working properly. Um, we've, been doing, we've been doing some of that anyway, yeah. and I just think it's actually carrying on working with Kelvin and Leonard's team around the design over the... Of the theatre or the well, path? Well, because the theatre's got to... It's got to join up with the pathway, and as Natasha said this morning, we've got to sort out the access issues and stuff like that. It's... it's, it's it's not as easy as what people think because there's quite a steep gradient there. So, um, and we're going to be aware of the geotech information that came back. So, so I'd say the steps are find out whether we've got the money. Um, if we haven't got the money, then um, uh, you know there, there might be a report back from the task force to council saying, well, the council's going to have to consider this at some stage, or maybe it's going to have to consider it in the LTP as a project. Um, later on, that's then fitted into the construction of the okay. um, the theatre. Now, it's not ideal, but, um, so there's a lot of moving parts here, and that's why we want a task force. We think it's really important. Thank you. So I just think it's really important to re-engage with those stakeholders. Thank you, Mayor Andrew. Councillor Siggy. Look, I just, um, just following on from <coughs> Councillor O'Leary, I want to ask, what, what's the difference between this process and the process we went through on Tuesday? Is there any much difference on appointing the right people for the, for the task? Uh, I, I yeah. think this is a, 
as Councillor Robs pointed out, this is a task force that's basically councillors and, and staff um, supporting that, whereas the one on Tuesday, um, the debate was around the number of external people and the independence and those sorts of things. So um, if you're talking process-wise, then, uh, it, you know, uh, it's really up to, um, and I think, I think uh, Councillor Gallagher has actually foreshadowed, has foreshadowed the right word. I've got to be careful here. Um, he, he, he's suggested a a um, number of people to put into the motion. I think the term is foreboded. Sorry, sorry. I hope I hope that answers your question. Well, sort, sort of, of. Sort of. Sort of. Okay. That's okay. And you might not it, be able to answer different. my second question. I think that might be have to be answered. I'm not sure what, by the mayor whether we need some important outside people to decide who goes on that. Maybe that's a rhetorical um, question. After what happened on Tuesday, I'm pretty over debating for half a day over who goes on what. I mean, at the last council, nobody wanted to go anything because there was that many... There were that many um, groups in this council because we've cut them back and so few, everyone's hungry to go on, and that's lovely to see. Um, but I just don't want to get drawn into um, Tuesday's half-day debate on what should have been a half-hour item, although I do acknowledge we came up with a very good solution in the end. So it's a long, long way to get there. So I'm not getting drawn in on that one, sorry. Um, OK, let's go to the vote. Oh, you want a debate, uh, Angela? Uh, moved by myself, uh, seconded by uh, moved by you, seconded by Councillor Jeff. So uh, the staff recommendation. Point of order. Uh, process is as a move of motion. I would want to, as you would expect, sure. speak first. I will, of course, exercise. I suspect my right of reply. Um, and if I can speak to the motion. Yeah, of course. Now, uh, my, apologies, uh, Deputy Mayor. my motion, of course, is uh, the first motion. Uh, the further motion, which I've given notice of, is obviously only applicable uh, if, in fact, uh, the first motion is uh, successful. And I think it's very important to separate uh, the structure of a task force from who may or may not uh, want to populate it. I just want to... Um, and, and to be honest, I think to a degree, um, even the debate we had the other day sort of reinforced my view is that um, the task force as it was previously constituted and worked, I thought worked uh, quite well. It was a sleeves rolled up approach by elected members engaging with, with staff around the river plan. Uh, what I observed from that process, there was strong consensus. Those councillors, in the end, even if they were not named to it, they had full rights to attend, to speak, and the decisions that came out of that task force, I don't recall even ever a vote. I think it was by basically um, consensus. Uh, I'm all into open government, uh, as you know, but the critical factor is when you're dealing with funders and partners, sometimes if people watch the debate in this chamber from those cameras on live stream, they can get the wrong impression as to how much we value and seek external funding and what our relationship is with potential future partners. And I'd rather that with respect initially uh, in committee room one. Obviously, all recommendations, keyword recommendations, come out of committee room one with the tassels back into this chamber in, in open um, session. The other thing, too, is I think a task force uh, assists us to be more hands-on in taking, you know, we have the broad vision of the river plan that was tabled and adopted under Julie Hardacre's mayoralty. Uh, obviously, every new council will calibrate that long-term plan. So this council, for example, uh, did one significant calibration. It decided not to pursue the multi-storey uh, apartment block next to the grey power on the green space there. We, we, we've decided this council is not going to pursue with that aspect of the river plan. What we didn't perhaps foresee in the previous council is the momentum, using the word, that would start developing behind the theatre, and also the increasing signs that momentum and other groups are very, very interested in trying to look at a pedestrian bridge uh, across uh, the river. Now, that was, uh, I think, in year 15 or 16 of the original plan. So those are good examples of where, uh, year by year, term by term, things um, get uh, calibrated. Certainly, um, I 
absolutely welcome, as you would expect, um, item B. That is entirely appropriate. And obviously what I would want to see is the task force give some con conversation around how we can we better engage with stakeholders. Uh, can we obviously engage with momentum? There are some property owners in the area that I think we need to do sensitively, need to do some work and uh, calibration. So I uh, so move this motion. Councillor Angela. Thank you. Um, look, I'm interested to see who the Deputy Mayor is going to be putting up for the further motion. I know there are a couple of members who are really passionate about this particular issue as well, and I'll support them on that process. Um, I do have to say, however, that I do find it interesting, inter in, interesting um, how different the mood is in this room on this particular topic. Um, the same process was followed on Tuesday. I'm not clamouring, uh, Mr Mayor, to get onto any group that you establish. I'm certainly busy enough, so I support, well, I may support whatever names um, the Deputy Mayor decides to go up. But I don't like the structure of the task forces that we have had this term, and I have said that around the waste um, task force and the parking, uh, not the parking one. Yeah, Access. was it the parking Access. one? Access one. They do go, I, I think they should have been formal subcommittees because a, a working group or a task force, in my view, should be short, sharp, detailed, to the point, do a project, the CEO's nodding his head, and, and then be disestablished. So. I'm certainly not um, uh, objecting to the gr to the work that those groups do, but I, I I'm not comfortable with the process. I think anything that is uh, going to be long term needs to have governance in the room, taking minutes, and um, uh, have that 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 democracy and that structure around it. So. Um, Look, I'm happy to support the uh, motion as it is. We are nearing the end of the term, and I don't think that this task force, as the general manager has said, is going to, we're certainly not going to review the whole river plan. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'll support the first motion and, and hold my thoughts for the second one. Thank you, Mayor Andrew. Yeah, look, I, I welcome this update from staff. Um, <clears throat> I think it comes at a really appropriate time, really, because as we can see, there's an awful lot going on. There's a lot of moving parts uh, to this plan, a lot of balls in the air, and it's um, quite hard to keep tabs on at times. And it, it's all important, uh, you know, we, we all have our eyes on cost, and it's, it, what's coming through to me is it's very important um, <clears throat> to get the nuts and bolts right and to be able to make decisions at the right time in order to be able to extract the maximum benefit from uh, partnerships with uh, benefactors or, or government funding. So um, I think we do need something more agile than uh, this room to make decisions, and to make recommendations and come back to council. Um, it is hard to, to keep it. I think if, if you look at all the moving parts in there, I, I would struggle to, to look everyone in the eye and, and say I understand 100% everything that's going on there. And uh, if we're a little bit like that at times, then imagine how the public feel. So I do think at some stage there is a need for us to kind of bring it together, uh, bring back to council and, and just re-present it to, to the public and, uh, informally and say, look, this is where we're at, folks, what do you think? You know, just to keep the public up to date with what's going on, because there have been a lot, of, a lot of developments over the last couple of years. Um, we've talked about the theatre, you know, all that sort of stuff. So I think it makes excellent sense to reconvene the River Plan Task Force to do this sort of micro work, uh, to assemble the pieces together so they make a bit more sense and bring it back to the council at regular intervals for these decisions. Um, I absolutely agree about Tuesday. Um, I think uh, what, what that proved to me is that this is not the forum to be getting into the nitty gritty. You know, we, as, as the Deputy Mayor says, we've got funders out there, we've got people out there who are watching, and I thought, uh, I felt for Kandra, Councillor O'Leary uh, on Tuesday uh, for what happened there, actually. Uh, it just wasn't, it, it didn't feel good at all. And uh, so, so, look, just, just in wrapping up, I think um, we need an engine room. That's what we need. We need uh, to get to the down and dirty, make some, make some decisions and make them quickly, come back to the full council uh, so the council can see the vision. And I think, uh, I think we've been missing this task force since it, uh, it's lapsed. So I wholeheartedly support getting it back and going so that can we push on with the vision. Thank you. Councillor Dave. 
Yeah, I just want to talk about uh, more about the way to work on details in council um, so that you can include elected members as well as staff. I think it's important that we do that. And I actually philosophically agree with Angela's point that task forces are too informal. They prove to be too informal. They're very useful and good discussions happen there. And they are actually recorded, Angela, um, but they are not formal and they have no exact um, status, if you like, and or reporting status or, or recommendation status. It's a, it's a little bit too informal for me. And she will remember how we had things about eight years ago when we did have some formality to those um, subcommittees structure. So, but that's philosophical. And that's for the future. Um, there is a councillor Siggy got quite cynical before about the difference between this and Tuesday. I think she a few things have escaped her attention. One of them, all of our task forces are open to all councillors at any time, never closed, always invited, we get the agenda papers. Whereas the project governance group was clearly, from the start, suggested as a closed group. It wasn't, others weren't going to be invited. It had 50% external people on, it had a different purpose. Um, so the way they were proposed being set up were quite different. To me, it doesn't matter, matter a hell of bean, amount to a hell of beans, who's on one of our task forces, because everyone can go. Perhaps it, it may matter who the chair is, because they drive the meeting agendas and things like that, but beyond that, it doesn't matter. And I think we've proved in some of our task forces that we're very open to input from a wide range of people. The, and there's another difference with this one. I think when you talk about Mangai Tapora being actually nominated at this stage, if that was any old council member, I would say that's inconsistent with what we did on Tuesday. But she is being nominated, clearly there it says, as the Waikato Tainui representative. And when you're dealing with the river, I think it's very important to have a representative there. Perhaps if it just said the Waikato Tainui representative without mentioning her name, it may have been a bit straighter, if you like, but it amounts to the same thing because she's the only one who is such a representative. And I think if we don't have that there when we're dealing with the river, then we're going to cause ourselves all sorts of problems not too far down the track. But, uh, hey more than happy for this task force to be set up and get into the nitty gritty and for all councillors to be invited and given that agenda each time because I do remember when this task force started previously that wasn't the case right at the start Mr former chair of the uh, task force not all councillors were invited or told about the meetings I know we rectified that part way through but this one it should start right Councillor Gary Thank you very much. Um, I'm speaking against this. I think the uh, river plan, the previous iteration, and what we're going with now is uh, glorious in vision, but obscene in economics. Um, and I can't see any indication that the task force will come back with anything that's massively pared down from the vision, and indeed it's likely to get bigger and more expensive. I think this generation of Hamiltonians have probably done their fair bit. We've done the Victoria and the river. We've bought the buildings. Um, I'd be happy stopping there and just uh, taking in, in, in mind the situation of Council's uh, economics and balancing the books and debt to revenues uh, situation. We are very close for a long, long time um, to being redlining the thing. So I think this is one of those, uh, what do you call it, discretionary decisions we can make. This is not core infrastructure. This is not building houses. This is not about prosperity. This is about the, cream, the, the, the icing on the cake, which I am all for, so long as you've got the cake sorted out. And I don't think we've got the cake sorted out at the moment, so I, um, I don't support the... Uh, other than some small steps, I don't think... Uh, I don't support going forward with the, with the grandiose uh, river plan, which I know uh, we have currently... I don't know if you call it on the books. It's in a book. <laughs> um, going forward, uh, although I know that... I assume that will change uh, with this... Um, with this group, but um, I'm not supportive of it at all. Thank you. Right reply. Um, no, I, th I think Councillor Dave made the most important point about, uh, irrespective of who's formally on it, uh, apart from you know the convener, which is a key one, uh, it, it's open door, and, and I point noted everyone should be told of the meetings and, and can t uh, turn up. Also, obviously. Uh, this particular task force will have a shelf life until October of next year when 
the incoming mayor, whoever, whether it's the current one or a new one, will obviously put before council a, an updated committee structure. We will go to the board to vote. Motion is carried, 11 for, one against. Deputy Mayor, back to you. Yes. Uh, now, I'm just, just bear with me while I explain my logic and obviously I'll move it if I have a seconder and then people can, can reflect or not. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm gonna propose uh, the convener as Councillor Taylor because I think it's important that there's a bit of new and fresh blood in this particular era. I did it last time. I think his role as Deputy Chair of the GNI is, is quite uh, relevant to that. Obviously, as the Deputy Mayor, I'd like to be on it still. Um, I'd also suggest that Paula Southgate, because she chairs the CNS committee, so I think there's a kind of a, with we're looking at the major tranches of work, uh, um, Obviously, someone like Rob Pascoe, because of his financial role and, and oversight, very importantly, Angela Leary, one, because her and I were on the original kind of task force. Why is that relevant? Uh, because um, we probably bring a bit of historical context from the Julie Hardacre uh, uh, effort. Without wanting to repeat Tuesday's debate, I fully expect Councillor Leary will, will be landing in the uh, gardens particular group at the end. I have, must have an open mind, but I'll be looking for her, her recommendation of appointment onto that group. So that's sort of roughly uh, five. It's, it says um, no less than three or something, but that's a suggestion. But I just want to stress Dave Mack's point, if I may, Councillor McPherson, this is open door. Uh, everyone has speaking rights, and hopefully if a task force working effectively, there's no vote. You know, in the end, you come out uh, in a non-political way in, in terms of a consensus approach. So if you just put bracket uh, after Taylor convenor, after Taylor, please, and then that, that's my recommendation if I have a seconder. And it, with the exception of Councillor Taylor, I don't think I've really talked to anyone else on this in terms of the membership. I did talk to myself about going on it. On the one hand, this and on the other hand. Well, I go, yeah, it took a while. It took a while. Can I just ask a question of Mark, or well, whoever, I'm not, not too sure who would be the governing person, but um, there have been works, uh, I remember the, the REAP thing um, was one where we were encouraged to come along but weren't allowed to speak. Um, so, so Martin just said that you come along, you can speak, but, um, and you may want to reconsider that because, you, you know, there's a, there's a, in impact, you want to be able to keep your meetings reasonably concise, but so I appreciate that. But if you know, I, I came along to the reap thing and asked a couple of questions, and got stood on, yeah. <laughs> so then go, didn't just well, sort of stuff so, it. So, uh, um, if, if excuse I'm me, a, oh, Gary, it's been clearly said that this is a task force that's open for any members to turn up at and and be involved in, and that's been said several times so far. So. I think, I think if I can use the model as Council Henry's task force with regard to waste minimisation. that could be noted then. And, and I, I'm not sure if I'm a member of it or not, but I do come and, and Councillor Henry is extremely tolerant of my contributions. And I, and I think in terms of the, the way we ran the River Task Force last time, I, don't, I think everyone sort of had equal go. If it came to sort of a whole line of hands, you probably would give preference to members. And if ever it came to a vote, then obviously members would vote, but I'm really hoping uh, I think if you have to have a vote in a task force, it's a bit of a sign of failure, personally. I mean, I think their great strength is they may take slightly longer, but once you've gone through all the detail, uh, you know, you, you do tend to arrive at, at consensus. I certainly found that with Accessible Hamilton and, and uh, Councillor Henry's one. Can I just be clear? I'm not expecting non... When you say members, do you mean elected members or members of the... I, don't, I wouldn't expect to turn up and be able to vote, but I would be expected to be able to turn up and speak. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I've said. You, you, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think these these are people who. I mean, obviously the ones who are named. You expect to be turning up to all the meetings. Other councillors are welcome to come, welcome to participate. Uh, that's just just my view. And, and I'm just thinking the other. I mean, I think the way the other task forces work that we've got at present are, are pretty good personally. And and I hope on this one. 
um, that we, we would avoid a, a vote, really, if we could, uh, you know, because it it's a working group. It's trying to arrive at a, a common direction, in my view. Uh, Councillor Angela. Look, I, I don't. I, I don't want my name up there only because I know that counts. Um, I can't commit to probably the number of meetings that they will have, and I know Councillor Taylor will allow anyone to go to speak anyway. But I don't want to commit to another task force next year. I've got enough um, things that I'm involved in anyway. So uh, I, but I do know that he will allow anyone to go and have a chat. I don't want the uh, cross on my absence list if I can't attend. And I've not been able to to, uh, to, to attend many um, Access Hamilton and waste minimisation and task force. Yeah, I know. So I don't want to um, set an expectation that I can't deliver. Uh, Councillor Paula. I just want to ask, uh, look, I'm, I'm happy to be on there, but at the same time, I'm happy to cede my place to um, Councillor Hamilton. Um, just a work management load thing, and I know you've expressed an interest. You are my deputy. I trust you to do the role, and I do think it's appropriate to have someone from community services, so I'm more than happy. Just do something a little bit funny to the gender balance, but putting that aside, I think you'd be able to do do it. If you, are you interested? Of course. A little sexist, but yes. Okay. <laughs> so I'm happy to swap my name out for Councillor Hamilton. Okay, all those four? Well, just to, I mean that's I always like number. <laughs> Sorry, no, you can bow your head, uh, and I'm not. This is not an afterthought, but I, I know Councillor Henry has is, is, is got a good contribution, and, and I'm Councillor Henry through the chair. Would you agree to go on this? No, no, I'm not. It's not. It's your call. Yeah, it's just a yes or no. I can come along anyway. Okay, all good. Leave it. I think Siggy would be a good addition. Okay, come on. She's been offered it. She said no. All those for? Any against? Carried unanimously. Uh, we're now on item 11, page 45. Thank you, Jen. So, um, welcome, Keith. Um, for members who don't know, this is Keith Hornsby. This is an information only item. So, um, give us the information so we can move on, please. We've got a big day. <laughs> Certainly. Uh, so, this is, yes, uh, just an update report uh, following on from an earlier report to Council in September, which in itself was also prompted by the June Council resolution to that staff investigate the need to. Uh, the need and scope and merits of undertaking a plan change uh, in the Tarapa North area and report back. So consequently, this report just provides a further update on the current status of industrial land in Hamilton and, and also looking at the, some of the dynamics in the wider subregion. And um, just to note that formal resolution of council will be sought early in the new year uh, to formally proceed with undertaking the plan change uh, for Tarapa North. Uh, to fully enable this area for uh, industrial uh, development. So if there's any questions. Uh, Councillor Rob. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chair. Two, just two very quick questions. One, I don't see any mention of, um, in, in the availability of land in the city, industrial land in the city, mention of the inland port. Is that, is that included in your calculation of available land? Mm. So um, what I did try to do in this port a report was to look at uh, land that's currently available to the market as at today or at yep. the time of the report. Um, so my understanding is that um, uh, the, the inland port is still under development and, and the initial, uh, some of that initial uh, land will not be available for another couple of years. So, But it uh, is designated industrial yes, land, yep. isn't it? So, so overall... So it is I'll, in that calculation of... Yep. Well, not quite available, but it is... Yep. It is, so, it is able to absorb the, the demand. Yep, over, the, long the, term, uh, over the medium to long term. So overall, we have a very large stock of, of, of land that's zoned for industrial purposes, sufficient for our, to meet our demand, uh, projected demand over the 30 years. Yep. But once you start then applying uh, infrastructure and ownership constraints and the like, 
uh, and then what's sort of in the development pipeline and what's then available as at today. Um, it, it is quite a small supply and hence the need, um, you know, looking at those vacancy indicators produced by the um, CBRE and the like that are showing what's available is, 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 um, is at all-time lows. Yep. Yep. Um, we, we should do what we can to, to enable some of that other industrial land to the north. To, to, oh, look, to I, I, agree with, I agree with everything in the report. Yeah. Just the other question is around financial considerations, and uh, you state in there that it's currently unbudgeted. Do you have any idea of what the potential cost might be from start to finish over... Presumably this is going to take a number of years, but do you have a sort of a... A ballpark, you know, is it is it going to cost millions of dollars to do this research and do the changes that might be necessary to rezoning land that isn't currently industrial into industrial and so forth? Um, yeah, there'll be a number of costs involved. There'll be the the plan change and the infrastructure costs. Yep. So the infrastructure costs will be the bulk of the costs. Um, I, I, I can't give you an estimate of, of, of those at, at this time, but when we formally come um, with the recommendation, um, we'll certainly have an have a, have a, um, estimated figure okay. and which would be um, clarified as, as we work through the, the, the okay. plan change process. So, so when, yeah. when are you coming back? Six to 12 months? Uh, no, no, sorry. So we'll be coming in, uh, as likely we'll come in March to seek a formal resolution. Okay. And then from, from that point onward, uh, the, the RMA plan change process uh, will, will we'll take... start from there. Yes. So do you think the motion should have um, a reporting back in March, just so that there is a process for it to come back? Um, can I... I'll just jump in. Councillor Pascoe, um, this will be part of uh, a review of all of the proposed plan changes that we have on our plate. So we want to go... Th so that is the report back in March in terms of here are all the plan changes that we're looking at and here's a proposed um, prioritisation of So that's the, in, Deborah, in the, uh, the briefing that Deborah did with us a couple of briefings ago about those changes coming through in the district plan. That's part of it, is it? So are you talking, so the REAP... The REIT plan change is already is already moving forward, Sorry, but there's yep. there's um, a, a number of other proposed plan changes um, on on the radar, and yep. what we want to do is uh, take a month or two to look at those and prioritise those and bring back a proposed way of addressing those plan changes so that we can do them as quickly and as cost effectively as we yep. possibly can. Okay. And this uh, work will feed into that. This is one of the plan changes that will be considered in that. So that's all set for uh, report back in March, is it, at the March Council meeting? Yes. Yep, OK, thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, paragraph 21 says that the analysis suggests uh, that overall there is no shortage of zoned industrial land in the sub wider sub-region to meet the level of projected demand, and then talks about the th two things you've raised, the existing ownership structures and infrastructure constraints. Can you I, I understand what... Well, I assume I understand what infrastructure constraints, with, whether or not you get storm water or roading or whatnot uh, for these. What, what is existing ownership constraints and how does that change if you change, in, uh, if you change the district plan? Uh, so, no, some of those ownership constraints... Um wouldn't change. So, uh, just to clarify, what, what I mean by that is, is um, uh, where a landowner um, wishes not to to develop the land for the purpose it's zoned for, for for various reasons. They wish to continue farming, um, um, and whilst development is occurring around um, that that area of land, um, they have no intention to to let to 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 sell it or to lease it for 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 the purposes. Um, other than what it's what they're using it for, um, so whilst you know we, we can count some of that land as as zoned um, uh, for industrial purpose, it's it's not it's not currently available. So the um, this plan change uh, where there are known those known issues in Taropa North and in some cases, it will not resolve that. However, there are still some residual areas. Which will be enabled where we we believe that um, there are no ownership constraints uh, currently. So th this would enable development to occur on those areas where the current owners are are, are, um, are thinking that it might take up an opportunity. Okay. So um, so, so the problem is that we have enough haven't got enough industrial land. 
that's currently available to the market. Yeah, okay, so that is, which means it's been infrastructured up and all that sort of stuff. That's to correct. Be when you say available to the market, it's able to be built on and someone could put a factory out there yep. in, so in the, 80, uh, eight months after they start. So the there's a, a lot so of there's not enough X hundred square metres zo uh, zoned with roading and a for sale, advertised for sale on the market. Sorry, I missed that. There's not enough, or that, so that's the issue, or there is enough. Sorry, I, I was just clarifying. Yeah, oh. what it, what what uh, what I meant. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. The, the um the little grid you've got underneath that, I can't understand what it means. So what? So demand total projected through 2000 to 47. You said Hamilton's got 524 hectares, Waikato, blah blah blah. Then the total capacity, what's that? So, so this is so, a Sorry, so that bit there, the, so taking Hamilton, there's 524 hectares of land... Demanded over, oh, the, demand, over the 30 demand. years. So that's a function of economic projection? So that's a guess. Oh, well, that's yeah. a, a very well-educated guess. Yeah. Uh, and then the capacity is, is the assessed capacity, so looking at all that, all that area that is zoned for industrial purposes across the city. But there isn't 630 hectares ready to go, is there? No. Like that, so that's the stuff that is subject to um, infrastructure, et cetera. Correct. Okay. okay. Is this is what's this this reason like why Mitch Plaw was moving out to Hatepu and those sort of things are going on? So, uh, I've I've provided some some commentary in in the report on on some of those business dynamics mm. and locational choices. And Andrew so, raised one without saying a name earlier on. Unless that's the same one you're talking and about. And so so yeah, different businesses will be sensitive to different um, components of of those locational choices. So um, I mean. I have equally. I, I know of businesses that have chose to locate into Hamilton, mm. so it's it's not a net outflow of, of people. Um, certainly, uh, land availability is constrained, which, um, but it's uh, you know p there are people moving around all the time. The churn is, is a natural process within the market. Okay, and on page forty eight, you sort of compare us with some of our neighbours, or just some other areas. The Howtapu Cambridge one. Um, I read the, the so the third column talks about currently limited land availability, blah, blah, blah. I, I read that, it, does, it sounds like there's no uh, de development contributions required out there. Is that what's happening there? Uh, not, um, YPA District Council does require development contributions. Oh, it does, so, okay. Yeah. I don't know why I took that from that, something's. All right, thank you. Okay. Councillor Rob. Yes. Chair, just one quick question. Have, have you got in mind uh, an area within the city for another industrial park? And is that likely to be what might come back, that you've identified a particular area that might be the size of, say, the Porter's Industrial Park or something similar, that you will come back to us in March and say, this is the land, this is a a block of land that we'd like to designate as industrial, so a, a whole industrial zone could could be developed. Is that is that, is that where we're heading? Uh, so so the, the focus of this series of reports and the plan change will solely be on Tarapa North, but I, I think what um, you're asking, Councillor, is it would probably fit into the, the wider work that's been undertaken around the, uh, the Metropolitan or the Greater Hamilton or the corridor work. So that, that those kind of... Um, Questions about where to next for industrial uh, provision would be would be considered in, in, within that work. So it will be a little bit bits of here and a bits of there of land, rather than rather than what might be you know like the Hautapu one or the or the Porters or whatever in terms of being several hectares, which can be which can be a multi-zone industrial site. Yeah, just, yeah, as I said, some of those industrial opportunities would be examined okay. uh, in that work. Okay. Yeah. Moved by myself, Still seconded by the Deputy Still Mayor. Clear. All those for? Aye. Any against? Carried unanimously. Keith, thank you very much. You handled the questions really well. Yeah. You came across well. Um, item 12, uh, we're on page 51. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Are there any questions? So we move to debate. Is there any debate? All those for? Any against? Carried unanimously. Item 13, page 55, Gary. Item, item 13, page 55 now. 
Yeah. Okay, Paul Bowman. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> and this report, um, I hope just to take as read, but it's really just summarising. Um, just hold on, Deputy Mayor. You did second it. Thank you. Yeah, Paul. Moving on, we're 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 back we're back on track. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Matt. Um, yes, this this report is uh, really just topping and tailing the affordability criteria uh, agreed by council uh, last month on the fifteenth of November. Uh, so really, this just uh, is seeking council approval to put it formally into our special housing area policy. I moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Rob. All, any debate? All those four. Uh, yes, sorry, uh, Councillor Mark. Uh, yeah, just, just briefly, look, I'll, I'll support it, but um, uh, cynically, um, because you know, I personally don't hold a lot, of, um, a lot of hope that this is going to do a lot for affordability. I mean, they're already call, calling Kiwi House or Kiwi Bill Kiwi Flip. Um, I can see that, you know, as soon as this house is sold, it can get flipped on pretty easily. Um, but look, I appreciate we're trying to do at least something to talk about affordability. Um, I just don't think it's going to go nearly far enough, but I'll support it. And thanks, staff, for getting it at least this far. Okay, and I'll just dive in and reply to that. Um, I've dealt with um, this government and Minister of Housing now for the 18 months they've been in, and they've signed off $180 million worth of benefit to the city, and they put, could well be signing off another $50 million plus of benefit to our transport um, between here and Auckland um, tomorrow. So. I'm fully behind this minister and this government, and I am not comfortable with negative words being said against them. Let's give these guys a chance. That's a hard, big subject, housing, and um, and and our city hugely benefits from our relationship with this government. All those for? Any against? Carried. Oh uh, yes, um, just uh, one dissenting, and that's Councillor Gary. Uh, item 14. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you. <coughs> okay, any questions? Uh, moved by Councillor Gary, seconded by Councillor Rob. No questions, any debate? All those for? Any against? Carried unanimously. Item 15. Okay, item 15, um, Jen again. Uh, Corey. Thank you, Corey, you're on. Okay, so we'll take the item as read. Um, have we got a mover? Moved by Councillor Leo, uh, seconded. S yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, seconded by Councillor Rob and Councillor Gary. Uh, just a, uh, we're changing some figures which will affect our. Um, Financials. Uh, this, will we, are we doing this before it's been included into a forecasting? So we. So we're improving the. Uh, we're spending one hundred fifty thousand dollars more than we had previously. I just want to know where that one hundred fifty thousand dollars is being accounted for. So there's, if you look at clause 13 of the report, the existing budgets are sufficient to cover those proposed increases. So you have budget for this. It's, um, it's sitting within our contracts budget currently. So why would we budget for something at 400,000 when it was 250,000? Uh, within our contracts budget line, we have a number of different um, consultancies that we engage throughout the building consent process. Some of those consultancies we don't use as much as others. This one here we've used a lot more due to increased workload and capacity challenges, and so therefore we have some additional budget within that cost centre from not using other consultants. Okay, so when, so presumably when we did, a, did the 10-year plan, we did our budgets and that sort of stuff, and we, we had 250 of this, 
And then, then obviously, within every, every budget, I suppose, is, a, is there some sort of a contingency thing, is there? Uh, so what happens which, which is... We, we may not see at the high level. We're looking at the 10-year plan. So what happens is uh, when we get different types of building consents and they've got different construction methods, yeah. and so some of those we can't assess or requires a peer review, so we'll send it away to experts. If we don't get that level of building type in, or if it's already been assessed before it comes to us, we have no need to, to send it out. So a number of the building types that we're getting in at the moment is around residential or um, duplexes. Um, so it hasn't required as much peer review as if we had got in commercial or industrial buildings. Okay, just just on a global, and it's not specifically this, but there's been a few things in, my, in just recently where we've sort of had significant cost increases and people have said, we're gonna fit, do it within budget. Um, does that mean we have uh, padded our budget somewhat, or, the, or there's? And I, I know you're going to say no, but uh, to what extent? No. So um, in this case here, it's a mixed issue. So this, in this case here, it's a mixed issue. Yeah. So um, we do our best to predict where light items are going to fall within the budget. In this case here, they fall into another category rather than the one we don't need, so we can free up some cash. This is a delegation issue in terms of the fact is that if we had the delegated authority up to $400,000, we wouldn't have needed it in the first place. I've got to bring it to you guys if it's over two fifty. Um, so there's that aspect. In other areas, the, all those things happen. We do our best to budget. Yep. Things yep. move, right? Um, we, don't, we don't budget fat. We, I, I totally... Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. But, but things will change, and yeah. we just got to roll with it. And we've been open with Council about where things have changed. Okay, it's just, I guess, that at the level that we look at a 10-year plan, we'll never see all those um, mm. contingencies and things like that. So we rely on people to be budgeting relatively um, economically, you hope? One of, the, one of the hardest areas for us to budget is probably the building area. Um, just the sheer nature of we don't know what the type of buildings are going to come in. Yeah. And it happens on the flip side as well. It affects our revenue because we charge different amounts for the building inspection fees and different amount for... The, the, the pre the pre checks and stuff like and that as well. We're only allowed to recover our cost, yep. aren't we? Yeah. That's right. Well, we're going to do our best is to attempt to recover our okay. cost. You never hundred percent get it right. There's yeah. ups and downs, but um, it affects both sides of the ledger. Okay. Thank also, you. Also, councillor, this um, this contract. And this is not specifically at you. I'm no, like, this no, is sure. now a, a general thing yeah. I've just noticed. Sure. And this contract in particular is around providing us with additional services to provide capacity, um, which is something that we've struggled with with the increase in growth. Yeah. So while we've got an increase in growth, we've also got an increase in income as well. Um, so, and with the capacity challenges that we've got, we've got a under um, spend within our revenue budget line as well, due to capacity. Okay. Thank you, Corey. Councillor Rob, yeah, this comment, uh, Corey, has really answered one of my questions, and that is obviously if there's more activity going on out there, there's more revenue, and so therefore some of this additional cost is is, is really as a, as, a, as a need to, to fund or to put expenses alongside that extra revenue. It, it would have been the case, um, having, but it isn't the case in this situation. In this oh, situation, okay. we do have budget... Uh, that is allocated towards consultancies. Okay. Um, so it's not um, offset by income. Uh, we're still going to be within our budget lines by, um, by this approval, if it's, if it's approved today. So there's not additional revenue coming in Th that's there necessitated is having to get Cove Kinlock to do extra work? The, the predominant driver in the space for this contract extension is around our challenges and and um, obtaining the right competence of staff. So okay. it's around okay. managing our staffing levels yep. rather than the workload that's coming in. So we've forecasted um, as best as we could and we've understood where our workloads are at. Yep. Um, we haven't been able to meet that demand as expected, hence the reason we're engaging consultancies. So this consulting firm who we use, and it appears that there's not too many of them around to choose from. That's right. Um, although you say there that they're very good, mm -hmm. and I believe uh, my understanding is they are. Um, are we are we finding the increase in, in in their fees as a result of more work or a higher charge rate or a, or a bit of both? Um, so in this case, it's simply because we haven't been able to recruit ourselves. So, so we're using them. So more we're using often them to work. fill our our yeah. um, recruitment vacancies versus the workload increase. So their hourly rate hasn't gone up. No. It's the number of hours that Correct. we're engaging them for. That's right. Yep. Thank you, thank you, Chair. And uh, sorry, um, Councillor Rob, it probably follows up on the questions that were asked the other day in terms of the uh, inability for Corey to secure 
the building inspectors. So we do our best to manage it off. Yeah. 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 Rob, all those, sorry, Councillor Leo, Councillor Rob, all those for, any against? Carried unanimously. We're now moving to item 25. It's a yellow paper which has been circulated. Um, thank you, Ricky. Um, I'm happy to move this. Is there a seconder? Yes. Uh, Councillor Dave, um, I'll speak to it in debate. Um, this is the most restrictive policy that you can get. Um, people talking about not having a sinking lid policy on pokies, we have a sinking lid policy, a true sinking lid policy on TABs. If a TAB has to move, if a TB has to go anywhere else, it cannot relocate. It is a true sinking lid policy. You cannot get a stronger or more restrictive policy than what we have here. And I believe we are um, leading the country in this area on this on this item. I'm very happy for this to roll over in the... In the um, in the form that it is, and um, and I and I just want to remind members that when the paper comes back on sinking lid policy um, in the, around about July uh, 2019, um, that this is where I believe that we should be heading. Um, we're in debate, Councillor Dave. Yeah, only that the. Um we're not actually discussing pokies here. I want to make that clear. Nothing to do with pokies. It's the other side of yeah. that, that same legislation. We're required to have a policy, and uh, we're simply required, if we don't want to change it, to make a decision to roll it over rather than just ignoring that, which is what Ricky's put to us. Um, this is an area where it ain't broke, so there's nothing that needs fixing. We are not having a whole lot of TAB submissions beating their path to the door, demanding more... Um, game, uh, TAB gaming venues, that's the standalone TAB one. See the note in here from Ricky that says that um, those little betting machines that they have in some of the bars around the place, they're not counted. We're not allowed to have any say over that. Like, and, and I guess that's where t the TAB is going right around the country. They're not worried too much about big standalone places where a whole lot of people go into bet because they can. There's many other small venues where they can, and uh, so the industry, to be honest, isn't really affected. They're affected more by the changing cultural climate. There's a whole lot of less people betting on horses and and, and other things like that now. That other legal things. So um, that's it's, it's it's sort of diminishing in importance. This particular area very much from when it first came in. And uh, our policy, while it is the most restrictive, the Mayor's totally right, it's also not very contentious because it's not an issue for the industry. Councillor Gary. Is the only gambling that goes on in these places betting on horses? Or, uh, or, or, or the uh, trots or the dogs or something like that? There's no pokies in these things, no. is there? Yeah. So this is, there's one on the back end of the, of the working men's club. Yeah, we, we are in debate, Gary, but yes. So I'm just trying to yeah. understand that this is what we're That's talking right. about, one of those yes. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, and there's no, this isn't what you call a class something. Legislation has pokies on one side and TAB venues on the other side somehow. Oh, okay. Ricky, yeah. no more precise. All right, thank you. That's, that's uh, all those for, any against? Carried unanimously, thank you very much, Ricky. Did you say anything? Smooth. He was. He's the man. I, <laughs> item 17, page 75. Um, I'll hand this over to uh, the democracy manager, um, Leanne, and I see that Brendan's here. You're welcome to join the table if you would like to. OK. All right. Um, thank you, Leanne. I'll take the report as read, but anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, I don't think there is anything I'd like to add. Happy to take questions. OK, I'll move. Is there a seconder? Uh, seconded by Councillor Jeff. Um, questions, Councillor Rob? Yeah, just one question. Um, in 11, you, um, you suggest that there's may, may or effectively rewritten, which to me suggests major change. Do you think a briefing might be better than a series of drop-in sessions. I just sometimes think that the drop-in sessions, while, they're, while they have got some advantages, um, you don't really get the view of the rest of the table. 
uh, you know, no, no, and given I'd its look, complexity yep. and... I'd be very happy to do that. Uh, um, if, uh, with your forbearance, you're happy for me to bring this back to the March count. So, because January is effectively out, any briefing, we could have a briefing at the February 14th, uh, I think it's February 14th. There's a briefing date in February anyway. Um, and we could go through through this then, and, and I think I agree with you. I think there are um, some matters to be discussed, and I imagine there'd be some matters there where there'll be a, a difference of opinion uh, amongst the 13 of you about what might work best. Sure be. So it would be easier to have that conversation in that forum. What, what I'm signalling is I couldn't bring a report to the um, 7th of February uh, meeting and, and fit in a briefing. Okay. And second question is, what, what's your timeline for, for potential implementation? Is it likely that the new standing orders, if we are in general agreement, is likely to be presented and potentially passed during this triennium, or is it something, and be, and commence in this triennium, or is it likely that Oh, no, absolutely. Um, Councillor Pascoe, at the point that they're approved, they can take immediate effect. Um, so, okay. it, 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 um, as you know, it's it's something that I've committed to do uh, for you, for, and it's taken longer than I would have hoped. Uh, I think we are going to get a good and relatively future-proofed and serviceable document out of it at the end of our efforts, however. Um, but once you've approved it, it can take effect immediately, so as soon as we, we get to the point of formally considering it at a council meeting, uh, it could take, go into, um, it can be applied from there. So your timeline is potentially March then to, to present for approval? Absolutely. Yep, thank you. Deputy Mayor. Yeah, so, so basically um, <laughs> the first document's ready for the summer barbecue for some light beachside reading. Mm -hmm. The beach, that'd be good. Be yep. A really good holiday reading, obviously. Just uh, perhaps the intervening point, uh, I mean, as you all know, uh, I think Councillor Rob and I have a, may have a similar view around the five, you know, I mean, I view five minutes, but I, I'm interested in sort of the rights of minorities, majorities, you know, what vote you need, some of those technical things where a simple majority shouldn't impose on the other lot. A uh, question, around, and then the powers of the chair. So, do you are you going to still be available for some one-on-one -on -one sessions of advice on that? It, it's um, just like you make some proposals. So, once I understand what they are, but then if I think we should do X and Y, it's how I should do that without being disruptive to the whole process. Absolutely available to have um, conversation that explain. Uh, my thinking in terms yeah. of some of the things I've proposed. Essentially, it is a straw document because it's only one governance manager's view of the world, uh, and ultimately it's your document, so it will say what the majority of you agree. Uh, but certainly I'd be more than happy to explain the whys and wherefores no, behind fine. the various points. Great. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Paula. Uh, just a very short question. Uh, in reviewing this, this um, when it comes back to us, thank you for all the hard work you're doing behind the scenes on it. Um, will there be some ability to talk how it, about how it interconnects with the complaints process? Because a lot of process, uh, complaints are generated from things that happen in this chamber. So, in my view, the Code of Conduct should stand as a separate document, but what we have done in this is um, connected them. So, they, the, the standing orders reference is very clearly Code of Conduct. That would be an appendix to the standing orders, and the appropriate parts are pulled through to, like, to the conduct section and points of order. So depending on what comes out of our talking, our conversation around this, it could be that we go on to review the complaints process as well separately, uh, if we want well, to. Well, yes, bearing in mind that that's only recently, uh, very yeah. recently, but so we haven't really tested the new complaints process thoroughly yet. It's only been in place for since March this year. Councillor Gary. You, uh, will it address um, remote attendance at meetings and things? Yes, I, we are proposing that. Because um, their current ones don't even address it, do they? No. no. Uh, so um, we're proposing where it's audio-visual. Um, LG and Z standing orders allow for audio and or audio-visual. I believe yeah. that there's probably some value in actually being able to, for effective communication, to be able to see as well as hear a person. Um, so the law does allow for that, does it? The law allows for you to uh, can be, be part of a meeting even though you're not yeah. physically present? There's conditions oh, okay. around it. Um, you, 
You can't be counted as part of the quorum. You're not. Yeah. No, but you can. can but your vote. vote does count. Yep. Mm. Councillor Brian. I just wanted to raise a point of order while we're talking about speaking order, speaking standing, speaking orders. What's your standing point of order, Councillor Ron? Um, I'm just, your yeah, Santa hat's gone missing and I'm a bit concerned. That is not a point of order. <laughs> we could put it in If you standing don't believe orders, in Santa, but... you won't receive. And there could be children watching too. No. You're a naughty boy, Councillor Ryan. All those four. Uh, have we got a mover and a second? I'll move. Hang on. I can't remember. Yes, we have. Yes, we, we have. Do. All those four. We do. Any against? Carried unanimously. Um, okay. Online voting trial. Um, thank you, Mayor Andrew. So, uh, so item 18, page 77. Uh, essentially, this is a an updated verbal report. This is an update to our last uh, verbal report to you, which you'll recall was in the public excluded section of the last meeting. Um, at that time, we agreed that at the appropriate time, uh, the CE could uh, make our, our position in this matter uh, public. In between that meeting and this meeting, um, you will have received the uh, press release from the working party that indicated that the Council's the CEOs unanimously agreed to uh, put a halt to the 2019 trial. Um, so uh, that's effectively the the update. I don't ha really have anything to add over and above what was in uh, the uh, press release. In summary, I guess some really good work has been done over the last 18 months, and I would commend um, the people that have worked very diligently within the Working Party, um, Auckland staff, Auckland City Hello. Council staff in particular, uh, and a lot of good ground has been made. The key thing here, I think, from the Working Party's perspective is to ensure that no uh, traction's lost, that the, the reasons for pursuing this for 2019 remain, and it would be great if we could see uh, this project through to 2022. But in the meantime, without uh, national local government sector support and central government support uh, it, the cost is uh, untenable for most of the uh, for the uh, participating councils particularly given that most have not factored this into their uh, tenure plans um, councillor Angela thank you um sorry Leanne, you said you to something about you wanted to remain important to remain in the process for 2019 and then you said 2020 oh sorry I said the reasons for the, the rationale for exploring online voting those reasons for trying to address that for 2019 remain and uh, we oh, hope see. that we would uh, that, that we'll be able to deliver an online solution <laughs> for 2022 yeah. And I noticed in the media release from Auckland that there, um, I mean, that's not going to be helpful for, to the public because they didn't give any reasons why. I mean, why we're not going ahead, why, why the working groups are not going ahead. So, um, CE, I note, did we send that out, or did we also we also sent our own media release out? We need to be explaining to the public that. You know, these are its costs, its timing, its the government regulations, and all of those things. Because um, people will be interested in why we're pulling out. You can't, we can't just send out a media release saying we're pulling out. Yeah. So there are quite a few, if I may see, quite a few uh, media um, articles or commentary. Like there was, uh, it was mentioned on. Um, the niche on the morning report this morning is coming in, and cost has been noted. Uh, effectively, the cost of a national system spread over only nine councils mm. is the uh, predominant reason. Um, as we know, there were other um, kind of considerations that needed to be managed, such as the timing of the regulations and that, in order for the trial to be implemented successfully. But cost is the, um, the main driver for halting the trial at this stage. So, um, CE, can we put out, can HCC put out a media release? Um, we just, uh, look, I think if I can just 
you know, it took us, it took this council a long time to get on board with this. So uh, I'd be disappointed if we, if we, we've got to feel something about this rather than just leave it up to the general media and Auckland Council to do it. We've got to have an opinion on it, surely. Yep, and I was going to ask yeah. the uh, governance manager's opinion on it. Oh, <laughs> well. So, um, so we have been uh, working, our comms team have been involved and have been kept up to date with what the working party communications uh, have so, been. And I think in the main it would be fair to say that Brendan and I endorse the, uh, the key messages in the working party communications. If you think that there's something um, more that our council should be communicating about this uh, happy to uh, to hear that but I think essentially and as I said to you in the PX session what the trial did clearly demonstrate was that the security uh, considerations which were quite a big part of uh, concern previously have been uh, satisfactorily addressed mm. uh, and really I think uh, the message that our CE has has shared with his counterparts is has been around the fact, and and they agree, is uh, that there needs to be wider sector and central government support for, and that that helps with issues like the timing of the regulations as well as cost. But the public don't the public don't know that the public weren't here for the PX. The public don't know that mu that that the most of the security issues weren't an issue. I'll work with um, I'll work with Leanne and with yeah. Natalie and take it offline and work out whether yeah. or not we can provide some quite yeah. greater, greater context to that. And this new one. Well, so it, is there, this maybe one it's not came the one out last night. Yeah. And so, and our total cost um, was eighteen thousand. Was that right? Uh, Fifteen. Fifteen thousand. What we approved and yeah, and that's great. What Thank you, yeah. Councillor Mark. Uh, no, those are my questions as well. Um, I'll wait for debate. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Councillor Dave. Yes, yeah, so I'd like to ask the governance manager what advice she would have for the deputy mayor, given that his road to Damascus uh, experience here, where he suddenly discovered that online voting was good because it would uh, bring out a whole lot of youth voters who may support him. How should he go about getting re-elected without being able to uh, sort of interface with those people over uh, an in-line situation? Uh, perhaps perhaps you could assign him a Twitter handle. So that would be very good advice. Thank you. I will. It's one word that the Deputy Mayor knows, Tamahiri. <laughs> OK. Uh, Councillor Rob. Yeah, thank you. Mine's a serious question, although it might, it <laughs> might, it, it might appear to be a joke. Um, but following on from Angela's, uh, Councillor Angela's comments, is this an opportunity um, for the Mayor to call in some of his brownie points with central government and write to them to suggest that in future they could offer some financial and legislative support for an online uh, voting. Because I think last term we had exactly the same kind of outcome and it just concerns me that next time um, we'll have, well we, we might not, but the council might have um, issues and it, it might be a good time given our good relationship with central government to say, hey, look, we're a little bit concerned yeah that we're going to be heading down this road again yeah. in two think, years, three years' yeah. time for the same, getting, and getting the same result. Oh, I agree, and I think the, as, to the extent that I can um, speak for the Working Party, uh, one of the big concerns is that this doesn't stop now, that, yeah, that yeah. We, we actually start here, or continue from here to 2022. Um, the, uh, the Minister has been written to uh, by the... Um, chief executives, but certainly I think there is an opportunity for the political wing uh, as well as chief executives to to advocate and lobby um, for, for the sector-wide um, and joined up local government, central government support that's needed to address this. I don't know if you've got any comment to make. We'll just, get the, we'll, we'll just get the um, we'll draft letter to send. And could I suggest we get the letter in... Um, a little faster than the letter that hasn't gone to um, to Waikato Reg uh, District Council. Can we get the letter out to them before Christmas so that it's spontaneous with the press release and and with the other with the other dialogue that's been going on? Christmas 22. No, no, Christmas night 18. 18. Okay. 18 just please. checking. Just checking. Um, yep. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so on that one, I'll ask the Deputy Mayor to sign that. I'm, 
I don't want to use my political influence for this at this stage, but um, Deputy Mayor, um, you could sign that one for me, please. Thank you. Okay, so that was moved by uh, Councillor Angela. Move because I was going to move. Uh, it. It's moved by um, Gary, so it can be seconded by Councillor Angela. Oh, okay. Well, then I'm on the list to speak. Um, Councillor Mark. Did you want to speak first, Angela? Here you go. Oh, hang on, Gary. Do you want to speak first? No, <laughs> You moved it. Well, you didn't move it. He's moved Councillor it, Councillor Angela. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Bunting. Look, it's really disappointing to get so close and be so far away, uh, what, twice, I think, with us. Talk about a Groundhog Day. And um, unlike the Mayor, who was uh, a big fan of the government and, and, and how, what they've been helping with us with. I'm not. I'm really frustrated by this, and they are the ones that should be driving this project. They are the ones that should be funding this project. Um, and it, a saying comes to mind: the better the the better the idea, the bigger the opposition. And having spent 11 years in this chamber, being strangely finding myself in the position of being the person putting forward these technological advances like I was the first one to have a blog and the sky was going to fall. Um, I was the first one to uh, talk about webcams and some of my colleagues, none of, of whom are here today, the sky was going to fall on that one. And, and I feel the same way about this, that um, the idea is met with so much fear and trepidation of the unknown. It reminds me of also of Paxters, when we put Paxters in, well, you know, hundreds of people were going to be killed on the street by Pax Paxters, and apparently the same thing, uh, the same opposition happened when posties uh, decided to ride bicycles. And I just, you know, how do we innovate and how do we be successful and try new things and do ground and groundbreaking projects? when we're terrified that the sky's going to fall all the time. So no, I'm not happy with the government. I don't think, I think, I think the next council, whoever they are, is going to be finding themselves in a Groundhog Day situation as well. Um, I'm heartened to hear and thank Leanne and Brendan so much for the work that they did. Um, I know at times it was challenging because you wanted to present this council's enthusiasm for online voting. Oh, goodness, that's unlike me. <laughs> um, so I thank you for the work that you've done, and, and I know that sometime in the future you will take what you've learnt and what you've, um, uh, the ideas that you have and, and, and yet again go into that Groundhog Day cycle and, and put your, your ideas and your experience through this process forward. So I guess I look forward to <laughs> the third or the fourth time Thanks. Councillor Mark. Thank you. I, I agree wholeheartedly with the um, previous speaker. Um, look, it's core to our democracy to, um, to stay in front of the voters. Um, you know, if we want the best voting system, you've got to have the best voting system. Um, we're dragging the chain. Four other countries are doing this successfully. Canada, Estonia, uh, France and Switzerland. Uh, they're belting along um, quite nicely uh, in their voting system. Um, it is core to our democracy. Uh, I would challenge just about anyone in this chamber to try and recite uh, three places they can post a letter. Um, and at risk of criticising the government and getting ticked off again, New Zealand Post is dying. You know, it's move on, move on. 87% of people are doing commerce, are do getting their information from these things now. Move on, move on. Um, that's really all I've got to say. Yeah, oh, but I would urge that uh, in the next term, um, we get onto this just a little bit earlier um, because it seems to be the closer we get to the election, the harder it is to do. So, yeah. Yep. Well, let's, let's say it again. Let's say it again. Thank you, Mayor Andrew. Um, it is disappointing, and all credit to those people who've pushed really hard. And thank you to staff for the work that you've done around this. It does need to be embraced and rolled out by the whole country because it's just not going to work if it comes out in dribs and drabs. Um, to me, it's about using as many tools as possible to get people to vote. I happen to know, as a matter of fact, that last election, papers were delivered in a period of abysmal weather. It rained solidly for like four days while they were being delivered. 
I also know, for a matter of fact, that many of votes were dis well, many, but votes were discounted because they were so wet they stuck together. It was un um, they were un no longer readable. They were just smudge. And also, some people have told me that nine they votes. they did. <laughs> was it could, nine votes that were unreadable? <laughs> it doesn't really matter. That's all history. We're thinking about the future. Some votes were discounted, uh, were not even filled in because people couldn't get the envelope. Their soggy wet envelope came in from the letterbox and went straight into the paper recycling because you're not going to try and dry that out. You've got to make it as easy as possible for more people to engage. And I'm, I'm not sure that online voting will be the entire answer because I think there's still a bit of apathy about engaging with the issues that matter. But I do think more people will think oh, that's quick and easy, I'll have my say. And so let's hope it's not used before we finally get the outcome that we're all driving at. Deputy Mayor Martin. Yeah, obviously, um, certainly congratulations to the work that uh, Councillor O'Leary and, of course, our, our governance manager and team have done on this. As you all know, I was a very enthusiastic convert to this very early on. Um, <coughs> uh, I don't share... With respect, Council, I like the current government. I love the current Prime Minister. He's wonderful. Obviously, we, we've got to keep working uh, with the government to, to land this in 2022. But I think one of the things that's been pointed out to me and Councillor uh, uh, Paula has, as Councillor Southgate, is you know, the, with the rollback of New Zealand Post, fewer and fewer post boxes. And I know that our governance manager and returning office is going to really, with us, address the need to have plenty of drop boxes, obviously not just in our libraries, is at community houses, because we've got to encourage in major places, shopping centres where people are, the alternative option of putting your vote uh, into, a, into a sealed um, voting box, etc. And I think that's very important because it does worry me, and I think the issue around uh, disability, elderly, mobility issues, uh, you know, where, where a post box is, is far away. I uh, certainly pick up the point about the weather and, and all of that. And, and to me, in the end, I think um, good voting should be a multitude of options online, postal, even the chance to rock up to a traditional polling booth or something. Um, and um, it's ironic that, of course, the government for central elections is encouraging, you know, form of spread voting, uh, etc. So, but without, for, hopefully we'll land this by the, in the next term. Councillor Gary. Thank you. Um, I'm a big supporter of online voting. I just don't think it's ready yet. It's exactly the same as autonomous cars. It will come. It's, it's, it'll come when the cars are you know, as, as safe as they possibly can be. And the same thing has to happen with online voting. Sadly, this time it was just too expensive. Um, online voting is going on all around the world. So somewhere on the line there's going to be a system that works well, but there's a heck of a lot of get, that can go wrong with online voting. And if online vo voting goes wrong, your whole election's buggered up. Uh, at least at the moment with the... Uh, and you do have, you have errors with paper-based things too, but people understand it. And for at least a century it's worked for us. Um, so I think we're foolish to um, rush into this thing and let ourselves be the guinea pigs. And that was always my... There was a, it was an issue of cost and us being the guinea pigs was always the issue I had. And they're still the same issues. And uh, uh, good on the, the uh, government for being smart enough to say, no, this is just too damn expensive for the benefit. Let's do it. Wait, wait until it's a bit cheaper. Thank you. Councillor Henry. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Andrew. Yeah, I, I, look, I, I feel sad about this because I think we are ready. I think we would be ready. I think the government doesn't trust us that we are ready. And, you know, um, petitions are changing the world today. We constantly ask for something on, on Facebook to, to, to sign up for and to, to put our, our name towards. And I think... These, these companies can take these hundreds of thousands of petitions to governments and change things. And we, we think we can't do a simple online voting. Give a little. Wow, it's, made, it's changed people's lives with the money they, they get. So to me, I don't think the government has got the trust in us that we can actually make make this happen and I, I just wish they had a little bit more trust because in three years time we did we we probably don't even know what a letterbox looks like and like anymore and we can't find one so it's going to be really tough um even this year, next year so um yeah i'm sad hopefully by 2021 
we're going to have that changed. Thank you. Um, so I'm not sad, I'm not disappointed, and I'm not scared about this. But this is very expensive, and there's no evidence that online voting increases voting numbers. And then on top of all of that, I trust our democracy manager, our governance manager, our, our general manager of corporate who, who checked this report, which is a verbal, which there isn't much here, but, um, and, and they brought us on the journey of turning us around to go with voting, when it was a very close thing probably a year ago, to then get through with the research enough to realise that the risks were just too high. So, and, and we're going to wait for another, we're going to wait. And, and so I'm, I'm not saying I'm against this. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. But when it's going to cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars more than what we're paying at the moment, let's just wait until the costs do match the risks that are involved and the reward that will go with it. I don't think it's far away, but it's just not here now. Um, all those four... Any against? Carried unanimously. Okay, we are now going to page 78, item 19. Um, handing over to Gary. Uh, yep, this is the uh, reparations to the cycleway on Tiawa. Yeah, you, if, yeah. You're, if you're happy, I mean, if you've got anything to add, Gary. Oh, okay, all right, I, I'll just recommend it. Yeah, rec yeah, I just seconded I, by Councillor Rob. All those okay, for, any against? Carried unanimously. We're on item 20, page 79, uh, handing over to um, the Chair of Finance, Gary, uh, Councillor Gary. Uh, that the, uh, I, I recommend that the Council approve uh, 3A, B and C. Is that what I'm pleased to say? Yep. Yeah, um, is there a second to Councillor Rob? All those for? Any against? Carried. We're now going to item 21 on page 80. Um, the Chair of Growth and Infrastructure. I move the recommendation. Jeff seconds it. Uh, all those for? Aye. Any against? Carried. We're now. Uh, uh, okay, just. Um, so on item 20 on page 18, it's two um, against. we have. Um, tw uh, we have one dissenting vote of no, two. two two dissenting votes. Councillor Gary and Councillor Leo, for the record. So, sorry, that's on item twenty-one on page eighty. Okay, eighty-one. Okay, so page eighty-one, item twenty-two. Um, we'll hand over to the community and services and environment and community meeting from the community meeting. Councillor Paula. Thank you, Mayor Andrew. I'm happy to move if there is a seconder. It's been well debated. So moved by Councillor Paula, seconded by Councillor Ryan. All those for, any against, carried unanimously. We're now moving to item 23 on page 82. Um, and this is for the Community and Services and Environment Committee Manager. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I thought we just done that. No, no, you've done the previous one. You've done the. Oh, sorry. One. Just waiting for you to move, yeah, Councillor Paul. I'll move it. Sorry, I thought Seconded you by done it. Councillor Ryan. Sorry, Andrew. Can we just stop for a second? I'm not sure what. I thought we were doing page 82. That's. Have we done 82? We're on page 82, item 23. So people are talking about um, a yellow bit of paper. Yes. So but, but there is an 82, which is a white bit of paper, in, the, in this agenda here. There's an eight, page 82. So, Councillor Mallet, that's yeah. a placeholder for the yellow piece of paper. So, oh, okay. item 22 okay. is on one side, and item yeah, 23 is on the other. Sorry, that's why I was. I thought I'd done it all at once. But yes, Sorry, move. So, just to okay. be clear. There's two recommendations on the yellow bit of paper. They're both different, are they? Uh, you're on item 23, Gary. I turn it over. I can't see item 23. Turn it over. Turn the page over. Oh, okay. I I got you. 
Written down the side here. Okay, yeah. all those four? Any against? Uh, so, for the record, um, Councillor Gary's voted against. I think I voted against the development um, plan that was presented to us. That's right on Tuesday. What I said was massive overreach. Yes. Myself. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So on item 23, um, Gary's dissenting. Okay. We now move to um, exclude the public. Um, going into confidential. Moved by Councillor Dave. Seconded by. Myself, uh, Councillor Leo, seconded by Councillor Leo. So did, so did these two all those, get replaced uh, all those four. Um, just before we go into confidential, has anyone got anything they want to say? It's the end of the year, for, for the record. No, nobody. Okay. Um, all those four. Any against? Carried. We're moving into um, confidential.